I want to send uh, uh, my, my thoughts, prayers, good wishes. She had gone into hospice, and we knew that she was in um, a difficult physical health. But um, for, uh, for all of us, and certainly growing up in Detroit, she has been a, uh, a wonderful uh, source of pride for us. And so I'm sorry to hear that. So we appreciate uh, very much your joining with us today to share your views and your stories on uh, Republican efforts to expand what we call junk insurance plans and to take away your health care coverage. And that's why we are here as Democrats, because we are so very, very concerned about this. Um, Health care, particularly protections for the 130 million Americans with pre existing conditions, is under attack again. And so we have to engage again. Before the Affordable Care Act was signed into law, insurance companies got to choose who to cover, what to cover, and how much to charge. If you had a pre existing condition like cancer, you probably couldn't find adequate coverage at all. And if you could, it had a surcharge of tens of thousands of dollars. Before the ACA, if you were a woman, you could be charged more. And if you weren't charged more, you could be denied services and often were. Before being required to pay out of pocket for prenatal care as well as labor and delivery, with an average cost of over $20,000 in 2011 for an uncomplicated birth. This put women and their families at real financial risk. As a member of the Finance Committee, I led the fight to make sure the Affordable Care fixed that, and it did. If you had asthma, depression, di diabetes, substance abuse disorder, you might not get the coverage you need prior to the Affordable Care Act. And if you were previously healthy but had a new medical condition, the plan could drop you and cap or cap your coverage. We are all just one doctor's visit away from being labeled with a pre-existing condition. And now these protections we fought so hard for could be ended. You're here at such an important time, and we're grateful to all of our panelists, our witnesses today. We're only a few weeks away from oral arguments in a court case brought by 20 Republican-led states who argue that the entire Affordable Care Act should be eliminated. Stunningly, the U.S. Department of Justice will not be defending the current U.S. law and existing patient protections. Instead, they have decided to side with the Republican governors and attorney generals who think their protection should be taken away. In addition, the administration has finalized rules that expand, quote, short-term insurance plans and association health plans, which we call junk plans because they don't really cover much. These plans are allowed to discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions, and they do not have to cover the 10 essential health benefits like prescription drug coverage, maternity care, and mental health care. And the last time I looked, none of the plans so far under these new rules cover maternity care. Democrats believe that health care is a basic human right. <clears throat> Let me repeat that. We believe that health care is a basic human right. That's why we've introduced a resolution to intervene in the court case and are working to stop the administration's weakening of health care coverage through these junk insurance plans. We're here today as part of an effort one more time to have to say to you, we need your voice and we need your involvement. We know your health care is personal, not political. Thank, thanks again very much for joining us. I want to turn to our uh, leader in the Finance Committee, our ranking member, Senator Ron Wyden, for opening comments, and then we will turn to our panelists. Senator Stabenow, thank you, and you have said it very well, and I'm going to be brief. First, with respect to pre-existing conditions, 
I think we need to understand that what this is all about is turning back the clock in America to the days when you have health care for the healthy and the wealthy. That's the way it used to be before the Affordable Care Act. If you were healthy, you didn't have a problem, didn't have anything to worry about. If you were wealthy and you had a pre-existing condition, you could pay for your care. And what we did in the Affordable Care Act, and Senator Stabenow remembers we had it in our Healthy Americans Act that had a whole bunch of Republicans on it. We said you ought to have loophole-free, airtight protection for those with a pre-existing condition. And that is what the Trump administration seeks to roll back. So I'm very pleased that you're putting a big focus on that, uh, Senator Stabenow. Then, with respect to junk insurance. These policies, in many instances, are going to be worth little more than the paper they're written on. And this is something I know a little bit about, because when I was director of the Oregon Grey Panthers, I had a full head of hair and rugged good looks, it was very common for some fast-talking salesman to come through and sell seniors 10, 15, or even more policies. They were called Medigap policies that really, literally, weren't worth the paper they were written on. And I will tell you, these junk insurance policies look like they may end up beating those rip-off Medigap supplements as one of the biggest rip-offs of our time. And just to be brief, uh, Chair Stabenow, we got a junk insurance policy yesterday that's been approved for sale in the Midwest. And I want to read just one sentence to give people a sense of how the strategy is just about denying people coverage. So. One of the points, and if you answer yes to any of the points, you don't get coverage, reads, within the past five years, have you or any other person to be insured been aware of being diagnosed, treated by a member of the medical profession, or taken mediation, which I believe they meant medication, for <laughs> cancer or a tumor, stroke? heart disorder, heart attack, coronary bypass or stent, peripheral vascular disease, cartoid artery disease, COPD, emphysema, kidney disorder, liver disorder, neurological disorder, degenerative disc disease, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, degenerative joint disease, diabetes, Crohn's disease, bipolar disorder, or any eating disorder, alcohol abuse or chemical dependency, or does anyone listed on the application currently weigh over 250 pounds women or over 300 pounds men? Now, that, folks, is not some kind of abstraction. This is a policy we have learned is now being sold in the Midwest. And it's pretty clear that that is just going to unravel completely. The good work that these and other colleagues tried to do Americans all over the country to try to say, as Senator Stabenow did it, and I did in a bill that actually had Republican support, we ought to have airtight, loophole-free protection. What I read you doesn't exactly meet the, that test. So I'm very pleased to be here with uh, my colleagues because we understand that what this is all about the president's pledge that he wanted to uh, roll back uh, the pre-existing conditions protection, that he wanted to roll back Roe versus Wade, is really, we've got a clock over there. It goes forward. This is about turning it back. So I really appreciate all the witnesses um, being here. Look forward uh, to your comments. And uh, Madam Chair, I know we're uh, building a record on this. I would very much like to introduce this whole worth little more than the paper it's written on junk insurance policy that the finance democratic staff that you know well 
has obtained and if we can make that a part of our record. Without objection. Thank you so much. You know, once again, as Senator Wyden is talking about this particular plan, uh, health care is personal. It's, it's, these are specific things. It's not theory. It's not ideology, not philosophy. This is about whether or not you're going to be able to get the health care you need when you need it. And that's why we're here. And so we want to introduce uh, our witnesses. I'm going to turn first to Senator Van Hollen, who uh, has the, our uh, first witness to introduce, who we know well. And my only uh, concern is that Ziamara, who your daughter is not with you because she's, uh, she's our favorite. And so we would <laughs> please give her a big hug for us. So Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Senator Stabenow. And let me... Thank you uh, for bringing this all together uh, here on this really important subject for all Americans, uh, protecting uh, affordable health care and a special focus today on protecting people with pre-existing conditions. Um, to Ron Wyden, thank you for Exhibit A on why the junk plans are junk plans, and that's why we call them that, and for your leadership, and great to be here with Senator Tammy Baldwin as well. So um, I actually have two constituents on the panel. Dr. Uh, Bohan works in D.C., oh, but we're very okay. proud that she okay. lives uh, in Darnstown, right. Maryland. So thank you for uh, being here. And I want to thank all our, wit our witnesses for being here, along with uh, as Senator Stabenow has. Uh, it does give me special pleasure to introduce uh, somebody who is well known, uh, not just the Democratic Caucus, but here on uh, Capitol Hill, uh, Elena Hung. Thank you for launching, uh, being a co-founder and current president of Little Lobbyists. And uh, as Senator Stabenow said, we all always look forward as well to seeing your daughter, uh, Ziamara. I was had the opportunity to meet with uh, both Elena and her daughter a few months ago, just before uh, Ziamara was turning four. So congratulations on turning four. And thank you and the Little Lobbyists for being a continuing president on Capitol Hill. Your efforts were a critical part of are defeating the effort to roll back uh, the protections in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we had hoped that would be the end of the battle to protect affordable care, but we know it's not. We yes. see this continued campaign of sabotage uh, against uh, protecting uh, people's affordable health care and, and protecting people uh, with pre-existing conditions. And so it's great to have you here to talk about uh, <clears throat> your own uh, family experience and why those protections are so important and literally a matter of life and death uh, to so many of our fellow Americans. So thank you all very much for, for being here. Um, Senator Stabenow, thank you. I apologize when I leave. It's because we have a, a hearing in one of my other committees, uh, but I'm grateful thank for you. the chance to be here. Well, we Thanks. know where you are and where your heart is yes. and where your fight is, and so thank you so very much. Thank you. And uh, our next witness is Sam uh, Blokal who is a self-employed small business owner from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, when he left his job to start his own small business, he signed up for an insurance plan, not knowing it lacked the ACA protections. And in your testimony, I'll let you share what that has meant for you. Thank you so much, Sam, for being here. And next, Dr. Constance uh, Bohan, who the second constituent of Senator Van Hollen. Um, doctor, the doctor is a practicing OBGYN in Washington, D.C. We are so grateful for your commitment and hard work. She has 35 years of experience and has dedicated her career to improving health outcomes for women. So we're so glad that you are here today. And then next we have Erin Price. Erin is a social worker from Alexandria, Virginia. She was 27 when she was diagnosed with stage 2B breast cancer and has since dedicated her career to helping young adults diagnosed with cancer. And we'll uh, look forward to your uh, observations. Uh, and, and we're so glad that you are here uh, with us today. And then finally, I want to turn to Senator Tammy Baldwin, who is by the way, leading our effort, she will introduce our uh, last witness, uh, Chelsea, but she is leading our efforts to overturn these rules on junk plans. And so thank you so much for your leadership. Uh, Senator Baldwin. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you, Senator Stabenow, for hosting this opportunity to hear from people who are um, living every day uh, 
in fear that they will not be able to cover loved ones or themselves. And um, Senator Wyden, uh, your recitation of the fine print yeah. uh, in one of these junk plans is exactly what we need to get out. Um, prior to the Affordable Care Act in Wisconsin, the uh, plans offered in the individual market um, lacked comprehensive coverage, um, including uh, none of them offered maternity care. So a young woman getting insurance in Wisconsin did not even have that option if they were in the individual market. Um, I am so pleased, I get to see you twice in one week, uh, um, to have uh, Chelsea Schaumburg here from Seymour, Wisconsin. Uh, Chelsea is a mother of three. She is a social studies teacher. And boy, do you have now a real life social studies uh, uh, case study to share with your students um, about how our democracy works and how we uh, advocate for change. But I first um, learned about um, Chelsea and her family when she became one of those committed Americans uh, speaking out when we were having the uh, debate last year on that cynical attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Um, she's going to share her daughter Zoe's story, and frankly, it's her whole family's story. And it is powerful, as is everybody who's before us today. Um, and we have just got to, uh, you know, I, I've always been impressed with what we can do in a democracy when we work together. Um, so thank you for being here and sharing your stories. Chelsea, thank you for making the trip from Wisconsin. Thank you so much, and I think we will actually start with Chelsea, and we'll hear from everyone, and then we'll open it up to questions. And for folks joining us on Facebook Live, we certainly welcome your comments and questions and involvement on this as well, because this touches all of us. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Chelsea, we'll turn to you. Hello. First, I would like to thank you all for having me here, as well as my family. Um, I'm very humbled to be able to speak to you today. Uh, my name is Chelsea, like you all said. I am from Seymour, which is near Green Bay. I am many things, including a daughter, a wife, a mother, a teacher, and now an advocate. The reason I'm here today is to speak about the importance of protecting the pre-existing conditions clause in the ACA. This brings me to my daughter, Zoe. She is behind me some, oh, maybe not anymore. Uh, <laughs> Zoe is my oldest. She would tell you she is five and a half years old. She adores the color red, loves to dance and play soccer, and is so excited about starting kindergarten this year. When my husband and I found out we were pregnant with Zoe, we were thrilled. I started reading all the books. I was following all the rules of what I could and could not eat or drink, and we were so excited to start our family. But everything changed when I was 24 weeks pregnant. I had an ultrasound, and I got the news that our daughter would be born with a congenital heart defect called transposition of the great arteries. This meaning her pulmonary artery and her aorta were flipped, causing the oxygenated blood to never be able to reach her body, um, and then she would have turned blue and eventually die. So without surgical intervention, she would have died. We found out we would have to deliver her at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, which is two hours away from our home. The hospital told us to prepare to be down in the hospital for about a month. This heart defect required her to have an open heart surgery immediately after birth. So to say we were devastated would be a drastic understatement. All of the dreams I had suddenly vanished because I didn't know if we'd be bringing her home. My normal pregnancy was gone. I had so many doctor's appointments that required us to travel to Milwaukee over and over again, and I cried every time we had to go, knowing what she faced as soon as she was born. Uh, finally, we packed up and we headed down to be induced in December. So Zoe was born in December of 2012. She was rushed to the NICU immediately after delivery and was eventually transferred to the cardiac ICU. It was so hard to look at this tiny baby knowing that soon she'd be in surgery. At five days old, she had her open heart surgery. It lasted about 10 hours and she fought for her life. Our surgeon, Dr. Mitchell, was amazing. I wasn't able to hold her until about five days after surgery. And that day I got her back in my arms was one of the best days of my life. We were lucky. Zoe bounced back from surgery quickly, but we saw others who were not so lucky and had to say goodbye to their babies. The doctor said Zoe was on the fast track and we were home after two and a half weeks. She had weekly appointments after that, um, which turned into bi-weekly, eventually monthly, um, every six months, and now we are at yearly appointments. She will have to be monitored for the rest of her life by a cardiologist. 
So far, she's doing amazingly, um, but there are some concerns that they're watching, including a leaky valve and a narrowing pulmonary artery. She may need future surgeries or not, only time will tell. Before Zoe, I will be honest, I never paid much attention to the availability of healthcare or the concept of a pre-existing condition, but after Zoe was born, I became aware quickly. Knowing she was protected gave me hope for her future. We were lucky she would be able to get health care she needed now and later in life. While Zoe's condition is rare, congenital heart defects affect about one out of every 100 children. It is the number one birth defect. Some of our close friends also have children with heart defects that re required surgery, and these kids would also be labeled as having a pre-existing condition, just like Zoe. Taking away the pre-existing protection clause of the Affordable Care Act would be devastating to us and to so other many families in our country. This protection safeguards my daughter. It allows and will allow her to have access to health, health insurance, not to be denied or to go broke trying to get coverage. She can't help that she was born with a heart defect and we can't get life insurance for her so we know what that denial feels like. During your lifetime, you get asked the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Zoe would tell you right now that she wants to do hair and be a doctor and a teacher. <laughs> the American dream tells us we can be whatever we want to be. I tell Zoe she can do whatever she sets her mind to and I hope she does whatever brings her joy. I don't want to tell her you can do whatever you want as long as it's a job that will give you health insurance because you'll never be able to get it or afford it without it. I'm pleading with you as a mother to fight to keep the pre-existing protections in the Affordable Care Act. The people who are protected by this are some of the ones that need health coverage the most. We are counting on you to safeguard that right and protect the American dream for Zoe and for the thousands of other people like her. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Erin, uh, yeah. welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's an honor to be able to speak with you and, and share my story on behalf of so many. Um, my name is Erin Price. I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. I was born and raised in Virginia. I'm a patient advocate. I'm a oncology social worker, and I'm a breast cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with breast cancer eight years ago at the age of 27. Like most people diagnosed with cancer, I wasn't expecting this to happen to me. Uh, I certainly wasn't expecting it to occur at such a young age that was so developmentally important in my life. I had just changed jobs two months prior when I first felt the lump in my breast in 2010. Since I was in a new job, my insurance benefits hadn't begun yet, so I was on a temporary insurance policy that I purchased on my own um, as a three-month stopgap coverage. This was also the very early days of the Affordable Care Act, and having just heard all of the rhetoric around pre-existing conditions thrown around during the health care debates and being naive to the world of health insurance, I was quite nervous that if my lump turned out to be something that needed medical attention, it wouldn't be covered when my new insurance started. I also didn't know what this temporary pre-marketplace plan would actually cover, similar to the stripped-down plans being offered today. Uh, so I waited. I waited for a month until my employer-sponsored health plan kicked in before I went to the doctor to get my lump checked out. I waited because I was lucky enough to have that option, um, and it turned out that my lump was, in fact, breast cancer, and I would have to undergo chemotherapy, surgery, and ongoing hormonal treatment at a time in my life when I was trying to build my career and build the rest of my life. I realize how lucky I was to have been diagnosed with cancer in the era of the Affordable Care Act. It meant I was protected from being discriminated against for having a disease that was outside of my control. It was comforting to know that there were options available for myself and for those that I work with. Uh, the ACA is by no means perfect, but it provides basic protections and a framework for improvement. And now with the continued undermining of this legislation, we are facing constant threats to even these most basic protections, despite the fact that an overwhelming majority of Americans strongly support protections for people with pre-existing conditions and fall into that category themselves. I have been one of the lucky ones who has been able to maintain employer-sponsored health insurance throughout my career, but these constant threats to the healthcare marketplace, as well as to the basic and fundamental protections offered by the Affordable Care Act, make me feel very uncertain about my future. Today, I am considered cancer-free, cured, but that doesn't mean I don't have ongoing medical needs. I have annual follow-up appointments with my doctors. I have ongoing hormonal therapy to take. I have to stay in communication with primary care and preventative care doctors 
to ensure that I don't have any late or long-term effects as a result of the life-saving treatments I had in my 20s. I hope to be alive for 50 more years, living with my medical baggage. What if I should have a cancer recurrence in the next 50 years? What if some other medical malady befalls me? It's very likely. Um, could I be stuck with a policy that in the future would refuse to cover this care? You've heard me say it throughout this testimony. My story is one of luck. Some bad luck, getting cancer obviously was not very lucky, um, but mostly the good luck I've had based on the privileges I was born with. I'm a college educated white woman raised in a middle class family in a suburban area. I've never had to live a day where I did not have access to quality health insurance and medical care. I've never had to worry about how I would pay for these services, but I do feel worried about the uncertainty of what I will have to contend with in the future. And I feel helpless when it comes to figuring out how to help the other cancer patients and survivors that I work with on a daily basis in my job as a social worker that have not had the same luck and opportunities that I have had. I work with countless adult cancer survivors, many of them diagnosed in their 20s and 30s, who are now having to live their lives shrouded in fear, fear of their cancer returning, but also a deep fear that if their cancer does return or if they have another serious medical need, will they actually be able to get it covered by health insurance? Or will they be left to die or go bankrupt? I know cancer survivors who feel chained to their current job because they have decent health care. They don't want to take a risk of changing jobs, starting their own business, or trying anything new because they're uncertain if, they will be, if there will be affordable plans available to them in the future that will actually cover their specific medical needs. To a cancer patient or survivor, health insurance benefits are a lifeline. The guarantee that you won't be discriminated against because of a pre-existing condition is a lifeline. The current and ongoing attempts to destroy these basic protections is a threat to millions of Americans. It is my hope that Congress will act to preserve the pre-existing condition protections and to strengthen the health insurance marketplaces that are so important to me and other cancer survivors. Thank you so much for the opportunity to tell my story today, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Well, thank you so much, Erin. We want you to live another 50 years plus <laughs> in good health uh, and success. Dr. Bohan, thank you so much for being here and for your service in the healthcare field. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Stabenow, for having this meeting. Thank you, distinguished members of the Democratic Policy Communications Committee, for holding this hearing that is so important for everyone in this country. Uh, it's important to understand the impact of coverage or lack thereof for the health of all Americans. And I'm here today to talk about how far we've come from the time that being a woman was a pre-existing condition and how critical it is that we protect the gains that we have made for women's health coverage, particularly when it comes to maternity care. As Senator Wyden previously stated, we cannot turn the clock back on women's health. My name is Constance Bohan. I was introduced before. I'm, at, I'm in private practice here in DC. I'm also the legislative co-chair for ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, so I represent the states going down the East Coast, including DC and Puerto Rico. I've been in practice here for 35 years and have seen firsthand the negative impact that the lack of insurance coverage has on the health of my patients. I've seen a patient with a risk for preterm birth not have coverage for critical preventive health care during her pregnancy, increasing her risk of having a preterm birth. I've also personally experienced the positive impact that the coverage protections established by the Affordable Care Act have had on the health of my patients and watched as patients are able to access the care that they need to go on to have healthy pregnancies and families. Before the ACA, as you previously stated, only 12% of insurance policies on the individual market covered comprehensive medical care. I'm sorry, maternity care. In some states, women seeking coverage on the individual market were able to purchase maternity care riders for an additional premium which could cost more than the monthly premium for the base policy, and oftentimes include lengthy waiting periods of anywhere from nine months to two years before the coverage took effect. These type of predatory policies were not reflective of women's lived experiences. As most of us know, nearly 50% of pregnancies in this country are unplanned, meaning before the ACA, a woman with insurance on the individual market would have had to proactively purchased an insurance rider, then in some cases doubled her premium if she thought 
she might conceive in the next year. The short-term limited duration insurance plans being touted as you've already discussed about as these cheaper alternatives to individual market plans that must comply with the ACA policies puts us at risk of going back to the pre-ACA era where women were left without the coverage they needed. A Kaiser Family Foundation analysis found that of 24 distinct short-term insurance plans currently marketed in 45 states and DC, none of the plans covered maternity care coverage. These plans, again, will turn back the clock on women's health. When the Institute of Medicine examined the impact of the lack of insurance on the health of pregnant women and families, they found that a lack of insurance led to fewer prenatal care visits and late initiation of prenatal care was associated with an increase in pregnancy complications and preterm birth. In addition, infants born to uninsured women were more likely to be low birth weight and have other adverse conditions. When a woman doesn't have access to prenatal care she needs, we as providers don't have the opportunity to identify and address potential issues early on. Early in my career, pre-ACA, I had a woman present with an uncommon placental condition that could be managed when identified early enough, but when not regularly monitored can cause severe complications and ongoing health problems for mom and baby. Because she had not had sufficient access to prenatal care, by the time this woman showed up, she had severe bleeding, which obviously put both her life and her baby's life at increased risk. I'll never forget a patient years ago who had a fairly standard procedure on her cervix to remove potentially cancerous cells. She knew that this procedure could increase her risk of preterm delivery, but she already had a child and she said that she was one and done didn't plan to become pregnant again. However, she did. So a number of years later, she unexpectedly became pregnant, but her insurance didn't cover her maternity care. By the time she was able to find an insurance plan that included maternity care, and she scheduled her first prenatal appointment, she was already cramping, and she was bleeding, and she was in the early part of her second trimester. There was nothing I could do. She delivered, and the baby didn't make it. With early intervention, we could have intervened and given her medication that would have decreased the likelihood of this tragic loss. For the health of my patients and the women throughout our country and their families, we can't go back. We can't go back to a time when insurance didn't mean you were covered and women's health, routines, women's health needs were routinely not met by their insurers. We should instead look ahead to ways to ensure that coverage is not only universal, but that coverage truly equals access. Thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you for your commitment to ensure that we don't turn back the clock on women's health. Thank you so much. Uh, again, not only for your testimony, but for uh, the care that you give every day. Thank you. Sam Loco, th thanks for being here today. Good morning. Thank you for Good having morning. me. Um, like I said, my name is Sam Blokel. I live in Chicago, Illinois, and I own and operate a landscape design and build business. In 2017, I was diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. As you can imagine, my diagnosis at 28 came as a shock to me and, my, me and my girlfriend, completely turning our lives upside down. The endless tests, scans, appointments, and treatments that followed were overwhelming. My diagnosis and battle with cancer was only half of the story. My biggest battle was the one I had with the insurance company that used loopholes in the rules to refuse to pay for my cancer care because they called it a pre-existing condition. A little over two years ago now, 2016, I began experiencing some lower back pain that wouldn't go away. I had insurance coverage, but I thought I would be smart and to talk to an insurance broker about upgrading my coverage for the next year so that I could better cover any potential medical care I might need. During the conversation, I was very upfront about my problem. I told the broker I had been experiencing back pain since October and had been to the chiropractor numerous times. I shared that the chiropractor had taken x-rays but had not made a diagnosis. I told the broker I was still experiencing back pain and would most likely be going to get an MRI in January. She assured me that as long as there was no diagnosis, my plan, the plan she recommended for me was the right plan. 
In fact, she told me that I would be wasting my money to buy anything more expensive than the plan that she had recommended. I wasn't prepared for what came next. What I thought was only back pain turned out to be a, can a cancer diagnosis that required immediate treatment. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is an aggressive form of blood cancer, but is treatable with an equally aggressive regimen. Roughly six months into chemo and radiation, I achieved remission. My doctors informed me that although my cancer was treatable, its aggressive nature makes it very likely to return. For my diagnosis, a bone marrow transplant was my only true hope for long-term cure. As I began preparing for my transplant, my insurance company told me that they would not pay for any of my treatment it became clear to me pretty quickly that my cancer would only be half of the battle. The insurance company was refusing to pay for the rounds of chemo, radiation, imaging tests, blood tests, and blood tests since I had been diagnosed in January, but they were also denying any of the p payment for the bone marrow transplant and I need to achieve lasting remission. They claimed that cancer was a pre-existing condition because I had visited the chiropractor in 2016. Not only this, did this decision by my insurance company alter my recommended treatment regimen and delay my recovery, it meant I had no insurance to cover the life-saving transplant that I needed. I appealed their decision, hoping it was some kind of mistake. While I waited for them to review my case, I was forced to do nine additional rounds of maintenance chemo to maintain my temporary remission. After months of waiting for a decision and undergoing additional chemo, my appeal was denied leaving me with approximately $800,000 in medical bills. And again, <clears throat> no health care, no health insurance for the treatment and transplant and needed to stay alive. Apparently, the, the type of plan I was sold by the broker is a short-term plan, and these plans don't follow the same rules as regular health insurance plans. Short-term short plans don't have to cover for pre-existing conditions, they don't have to cover the basic treatments for cancer like prescription drugs. After spending countless hours on the phone, mostly on hold, working with several lawyers, relying on family and friends who made emotional and financial sacrifices to save my life and experiencing enormous amount of brainstorming or amount of stress brainstorming how to stay alive. I was able to buy a new health insurance plan that would cover my transplant. Today, my cancer is in remission. My transplant, when I finally got it, went well. I'm not completely out of the woods, but I am lucky to be as healthy as I am today. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about my financial disaster that has somehow, some way, proven to be as challenging as the fight against cancer itself. Instead of planning a life together with my fiance, and a future for my business. I'm kept up at night worrying about how to stay afloat, pay the next bill, and how to avoid bankruptcy. It's clear my story is about, it's clear that my story is about fighting, it's clear that my story is about fighting more than cancer. It's about fighting for rules that protect patients when they need it most. Someone with insurance shouldn't have to worry about their plan being filled with small print loopholes that let insurers deny care when they need it. Someone with insurance shouldn't have to worry about getting a bill for $800,000 in the middle of treatment. Someone with, insurance shouldn't, someone with insurance shouldn't get a letter from their insurer refusing to pay the life-saving procedure because they say it's a pre-existing condition. Someone with insurance shouldn't have to spend weeks and months fighting with their insurer while they're in the middle of their cancer treatment. Someone with insurance shouldn't have to consider bankruptcy just because they fought cancer. This all seems like common sense, but for me, unfortunately, I expect to hear many more stories like mine. That's because federal rules protecting consumers from the loopholes and short-term health plans have disappeared. These new rules allow these health plans, like the one I had, to continue to discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions and exploiting loopholes to avoid paying for life-saving care when someone gets sick. I'm in front of you today speaking on behalf of people like me with pre-existing conditions, urging you to prevent insurance companies from selling short-term plans <laughs> from taking advantage of the people you represent. Thank you for your time. Sam, thank you so much. Um, you're speaking for many, many people, and we appreciate your coming forward and telling your story. We're glad that 
um, from a health standpoint that things have gone well and you shouldn't be in the situation you're in, um, struggling uh, on the financial end. And that's really what this is all about and what we're all fighting for because this could happen to anybody, right? Anybody at any time. We never know. Uh, so uh, that's why health care is something we should all be committed to making to providing and, and making sure that people have what they need and don't go bankrupt in the process. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I, first, let me say we're glad to have Senator Jean Shaheen with us from New Hampshire. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and uh, Elena Hung, thank you so much again. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to tell my story and share my concerns with you today. Thank you to the four individuals who share your stories with, with us this morning. My name is Elena Hung, and I am a mom. I'm a proud mom of an amazing four-year-old. In a few weeks, my daughter, Ziomara, will be going back to school, starting pre-K-4 at the inclusive special education program that she loved so much last year. We have had a lot of fun this summer, going to the pool, the playground, the library, and our favorite, to baseball games. This was not always a given. It has been a long road to this moment. Ziomara was born with com chronic, complex medical conditions affecting her airway, lungs, heart, and kidneys. She was born with 10 pre-existing conditions and spent the first five months of her life in the neonatal intensive care unit. She uses a tracheostomy to breathe and a ventilator for additional respiratory support. She, use, she relies on a feeding tube for all of her nutrition. She participates in weekly therapies to help her learn how to walk, talk, and eat by mouth. But I am thrilled to tell you that today, Ziomara is thriving. She is happy, she is kind, and smart, and funny, and a little bit naughty, and she is the greatest joy of my life. This past year was her best year yet, health-wise, and ironically, it was also the year that her access to health care has been the most threatened. The threats have come from every angle with ongoing congressional repeal efforts, harmful regulations, a federal lawsuit in Texas, a budget that cuts funding to life-saving Medicaid programs, and most recently, a Supreme Court nominee with a hostile record against those with pre-existing conditions and people with disabilities. Ziomara has made incredible progress, and I am terrified that that progress will be taken away. Families like mine, families with medically complex children, are terrified. That is why we started speaking up, so we can share what is possible with access to health care and what is at stake without it. As the little lobbyist families and I watched the news of repeal efforts unfold last year, we asked ourselves, how can the party that claims to be pro-life and pro-family be leading the charge to repeal the protections that saved our babies' lives and saved our families from bankruptcy? How can lawmakers talk about supporting our children but cast votes to take their health care away. How is that pro-life? Choosing life like I did is not a decision you make once. It is a decision you make over and over and over again every single day. It is a decision you make with the support of your government with the support and protections of the Affordable Care Act that says your baby's 10 pre-existing conditions will never prevent her from getting the care that she needs to survive and thrive. In every decision before me, I chose life for Ziomara. I chose life throughout my prenatal care as I attended one maternal fetal specialist appointment after another. I chose life every single one of those 169 days that I spent at her NICU bedside. I chose life with every medical procedure, every surgery, starting with her heart surgery at 11 days old, every discharge to go home, and every 911 call, 
ambulance ride and readmission to the hospital that followed. Every medical appointment, every therapy session, every piece of life-saving medical equipment, every box of medical supplies that gets delivered to our doorstep on the first of the month, every medication, every specialist, every second opinion. I chose life for Xiomara every single day. That is what pro-life is. That is what healthcare is. Healthcare is coverage for her 10 pre-existing conditions without penalty. Healthcare is insurance that does not put a lifetime cap on her care, which cost over $3 million before she turned one. Healthcare is emergency care, hospitalizations, and specialists, all essential health benefits. Healthcare is Medicaid that pays for the therapies that support her independence. Healthcare is long term services and supports that tells people with disabilities that they have a right to live their lives in their communities as they choose. I co-founded Little Obvious because these are the stories that desperately need to be told and heard. There are thousands of children like Xiomara in each of your states, and that's millions of pre children with pre-existing conditions across the country who deserve a shot at life. There are millions of families being harmed right now, filled with anxiety about our future because of our government's ongoing attacks on our health care. I'm asking the members of Congress to work together so I can watch my daughter Yomara grow up, so all the little lobbyist families can watch their children reach their greatest potential. I am here to remind every member of Congress that you work for us. At the end of the day, if you're not working to protect our kids, we will work to elect those who will. Children's health should not be a partisan issue. I know we can be better. I know that. Let's do better, please, for our children. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elena, and to all of you. And uh, I'm sitting here listening to all of you and thinking about how um, health care affects all of us. Again, it's personal. It's not political. You can, other kinds of insurance, you can, if you don't have car insurance, not have a car. Although, coming from Michigan, I hope you do, and that it's an American, <laughs> Michigan-made, actually. Lots of cars. Yeah, yeah, we have lots of cars. But, but you know, it, you, the consequence of not getting car insurance is you don't have a car, or house insurance, you don't have a house. Health insurance doesn't, if you don't have it, doesn't mean you're not going to get sick. It's totally different, and we should be committed to it and viewing it in a different way in terms of being, again, a basic human right. Uh, so first let me ask um, uh, both uh, Elena and Chelsea as moms, when you think about your daughters growing up, um, you know, if, if somehow we're not able to stop this and we're going to do everything humanly possible to do that, uh, what do you tell them and going forward, how does this impact them? Elena, let me ask you first. How this impacts my daughter. I look at my daughter and I see a life full of potential. I say yes to everything she wants and in a world that tells her no, I'm not going to stop doing that. Uh, so I'm going to keep fighting for her and tell her that she can be anything she wants to be. Thank you. And we, we know that you are serious because when we had that historic vote in the U.S. Senate and said no to repealing the Affordable Care Act and walked outside at 2 o'clock in the yes. morning, you guys were there. Yes, so. she was there. <laughs> she was there. So thank you for that. Um, and Chelsea, uh, you you have insurance, right? So when Zoe is born, you have insurance. Um, so think going forward, um, what happens if uh, pre-existing conditions are not covered and we, we don't see a comprehensive health care for Zoe? What what what's your what happens for Zoe? Well, Zoe would have to be very choosy as to what she chooses for her profession from here on out and what she wants to do in that profession. She'd always want to make sure she's working for a company that offers health care 
and that it's health care that is decent because she is going to have to have these appointments for the rest of her life. So for me, that takes away her American dream of being able to be whatever she wants because she's going to have to keep that in the back of her head as to always thinking, okay, I need to have health care. Where do I get that and how do I get that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and Erin, thank you so much for sharing your story on, about cancer and, and uh, what you've gone through. And now you're working with other people as yeah. well, other young adults. What do you fear most when it comes to your health? And what do you hear from the people you work with in terms of their greatest fear? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, what I personally fear is just that uncertainty of what what are we what are we looking at? You know, what is what am I? What's the playing field going to be in five years? I don't know. You know, I I know what's happening right now. I I have stability, but there's just this very foggy future for healthcare, and we don't know what we're facing. So it's hard to plan more than a year, a couple months ahead of time. And so I think what I hear from young adults, in particular, but also all adults, is that you know they're very chained down to, to what they're doing. They're chained down to their benefits um, if they are lucky enough to have them. Um, and so it just adds a layer of complication uh, to everything that we're, that we're doing. And, uh, you know, I think any, as you pointed out, any, anybody can befall this. You know, when I was diagnosed at 27, I was a healthy young adult who shouldn't need health insurance, right? I fall into the, I, I fell into that uh, category of people who would be great targets for these junk health plans. And had I been on one, it would have been a terrible situation. So um, literally, so many people I know diagnosed with cancer had no knowledge that this was going to befall them or any other condition. We don't necessarily aren't able to plan to be sick. It happens. Right. Thank you so much. And Dr. Bohan, you were speaking about consequences of women not being able to get the prenatal care and the, the care that they need. And what if you could speak a little bit more about uh, how it is much more expensive not to cover prenatal care and, and, and prevention than it is to actually have basic prenatal care and maternity care covered. It's, it's not a very wise decision financially. It, is it any more than it is from a health standpoint? Oh, absolutely not. Um, there are so many things that can happen. Um, there's one syndrome that's called preeclampsia. It's, it's um, high blood pressure. And so if we can identify women that have high blood pressure issues and monitor them and get them as far as possible into pregnancy before we have to deliver, that is a success because we have a mom and we have a baby. So we have two patients that we are responsible for. And if a woman comes in and she's very late um, with her first visit and her blood pressure is very high, we may have no choice but what to, to deliver her. And then we have a premature baby and we have all the issues of a premature baby. There are health issues that women have. There are bleeding problems that some women have. There are medications that some women are on that they shouldn't be on. We know that there's a higher instance of diabetes associated with pregnancy. And if we can identify those issues much earlier on, we can get the patient further into her pregnancy. We can get a healthier baby. We can get a team in if we need to have a team to come in and be available to provide the surgery. We, we can get these patients to a center where they can deliver, where they can have services, to, for example, to take care of a baby that, that has cardiac problems. So it's, it's imperative that we get these women early. Thank you. And then finally, uh, Sam, could you talk a little bit about how this short-term plan that you purchased was advertised to you, and what advice would you give to other people about those kinds of plans? Yeah. Um, well, I had insurance going in 2016 and, and was experiencing this back pain, so I figured I'd reach out to a broker and make sure that my coverage would be adequate for any kind of treatment moving forward thinking I was doing the right, responsible thing. Um, she kind of put it, the broker kind of put it to me as, unless you want to throw money away, this is a better plan for you for less cost. So I think nobody wants to throw money away. So yeah. you, you 
to say, sure. I, I made it very clear what my situation was and that I was no insurance expert by any means and hopefully she knew her job. And um, I ended up with this short-term policy. I mean, it's almost what she didn't tell me was just as important as that if this lower back pain could be tied to any kind of illness over the next year, it would, wouldn't be covered. Um, she didn't tell me that she, there was incentive for them to sell these plans. So they're more profitable for the insurance company. Now, had she told me that stuff, I, I actually went into the, to the meeting telling her I could afford to spend another $100 a month on health insurance and walked away saving a little bit of money but had this junk plan. So. Yeah. Well, thank you again for sharing this and really raising the red flag on this. And as I said earlier, Senator Baldwin's really um, going to be leading our effort to try to stop this. So, uh, Senator Wyden. Hey, thank you, Senator Stabenow. And all of us are going to be assisting Senator Baldwin because she's yeah. going to have some heavy lifting to do to take on these rip-off artists. And let me, if I might, start with you, Sam, because the way I come at it is decent, responsible government shouldn't let companies or brokers call what you bought insurance, plain and simple. They shouldn't allow it. And let the record show that Sam was nodding his head in the <laughs> affirmative. I agree. Thank you. And I think the first question I wanted to ask of you, because I think what happened to you is what's going to happen to people who buy that junk insurance that I just described in my opening statement, that particular example, where basically after you go through all the stuff they won't cover, there's no there there. There's no insurance there. When you were buying what you thought, and they kept telling you, was real health insurance. Do you ever imagine being in this kind of situation when you're up to your eyeballs in debt, $800,000 in medical bills, practically, as you described it, a noose under your neck? Did you ever think that buried in all that fine print and, and loopholes that I and my colleagues are talking about, you'd get left in a situation like this? Absolutely not. I mean, I think it's obvious that no one would be expecting this, but um, I think it's just as important to note that, like, I don't think most people are reading the full 180-page description of their insurance policy before they sign it. You think? Unless they have a few <laughs> days to go over it. Um, not only that, but shopping for my new insurance plan, um, trying to make sure this didn't happen again. I had some lawyers look over new policies, and none of them would give me a bulletproof answer as far as whether or not it could, it would cover my treatment moving forward, or cover this transplant moving forward, just because they're written so vaguely, so many gray areas, so many loopholes. Um, I just think it's a huge problem. Well, I just wanted to bring this up because it doesn't have to be this way. No. And I'm so pleased to see Elena and all the wonderful little lobbyists. It reminds me of my Grey Panther friends because the Grey Panthers and senior groups, we beat the insurance lobby. We beat them. And when seniors were buying 15, 20 policies that were worthless, we got a law written called the Medigap Law, which basically, to use the language of the times, actually drained the swamp, and now there are only a handful of choices and nobody ever complains. So that's what Senator Baldwin is going to lead us in doing, is making sure we drain this swamp. And I just want to leave you with one last point, because I 
I know my colleagues uh, have questions uh, as well. Apropos of this not having to be this way and how the seniors beat what was sort of a senior version of junk insurance had pretty much the same kinds of things. They had these subrogation clauses, so if a senior actually got covered somewhere but they bought another policy, the two would cancel each other out. So the, the parallel is very similar. And now we're spending $3.5 trillion on health care. There are about 325 million of us. You divide 325 million into 3.5 trillion, and every family of four could practically get a check for $40,000 to go buy something that wouldn't have left Sam in the position he's in. So it doesn't have to be this way, and I so appreciate uh, all of you, this has really been uh, an important uh, panel, and you should know, not just the three of us, but our caucus is all in in this fight. We always decided that health care is the most important issue. If you and your loved ones don't have your health, there's really nothing else. So we are all in on this fight, and we're going to have a juggernaut, a citizens-led juggernaut behind Senator Baldwin in this effort, and Senator Stabenow and I are on the committee that's going to be working with Senator Baldwin. So big, big thanks, and uh, look forward to working closely with you in the days ahead. And the Finance Committee, our motto is, if the little lobbyists are in the neighborhood, we're in pretty good shape. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin. Thank Welcome. you. Um, I want to thank you again, uh, Senator Stabenow, for uh, holding this critically important hearing. Um, and I hope that what has been said in this room, you know, I, I see cameras and recording devices, it really needs to get out. Um, I, all of you have dedicated yourself to retelling your stories so that we can make change. I, I want to just sort of recall uh, some history of, of where we are and how we got here, um, as well as uh, perhaps be a little political. Um, you know, I well remember the letters that I used to get as a representative in the House of Representatives um, prior to the uh, passage of the Affordable Care Act. Um, I remember all the tricks that could be played with insurance sold in the individual market. Um, I'll give you one example. A, a, a family uh, from Beloit, Wisconsin uh, had uh, contacted me with their story. Um, Dad got cancer, and uh, they thought they were fully insured. And the um, fine print basically said there was um, a $10,000 limit of coverage for the chemotherapy. And I think that covered the first round of chemotherapy. The uh, second round, the family discussed and decided, well, we're going to put it, we're, we're going to take out a, a sort of home equity loan on, on our home uh, to cover the second round of chemo. And the third round, they actually collectively put in their credit cards and maxed them out. That's what families do. Um, not surprisingly, the letter um, and story that they told ended with bankruptcy. Half of all bankruptcies prior, well, I'm sitting by the bankruptcy expert of the, of the entire Congress, half of all bankruptcies before the Affordable Care Act was passed had a health-related cause. And uh, that effort to draft protections so that insurance companies could no longer write their own rules um, had to look at all these different ways, these loopholes that... Um, 
had been used to exclude people from getting coverage of things that they needed coverage for. So, you know, most shocking was learning about insurance companies that could just drop you when you got sick. I mean, I, I hardly believe that that could happen. Um, but then um, they could also, in some cases, exclude the, the uh, condition you presented for. Um, they often had annual limits, like the uh, family I described in Beloit, uh, $10,000 for chemo, or um, lifetime limits, so that once you hit that lifetime limit, even if you were keeping on paying in premiums, they wouldn't help you beyond that. Uh, certainly, if you were trying to get new insurance, they could say, you have a pre-existing condition and we won't cover it, or as Senator Wyden described when he was reading through the fine print, um, they could carve out your condition, or they could say, well, we'll offer you comprehensive insurance and it'll cost you something that you couldn't possibly afford to pay. Uh, so we passed something that finally put some rules on this that made sense. Uh, in the wake of that, there were 50 plus attempts to repeal the Affordable Care Act outright. It didn't get a lot of public attention. It was like after 50 times, oh, they're doing it again. But we had um, some checks and balances back in that time that meant it, it didn't go through. And um, I guess what I'm going to say is, number one, um, elections have consequences. And all of a sudden, something that was just a show, uh, uh, you know, bash the Affordable Care Act became something that could be real. And then when it was narrowly defeated in the Senate by one vote last year, um, we start seeing other ways to undermine it. And I'll ask the chairwoman if I can be yielded an extra minute uh, to... Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so Congress didn't repeal it. Now the administration is using all sorts of rulemaking authority to undermine it, to pull the threads out, to unravel it. And we have a case going up to the Supreme Court. And Elena, thank you for being one to mention that the decision of who fills that vacancy will have impact on this issue. But I just wanted to say a couple more words about the, um, the administrative efforts to unravel this. Um, the junk plans, if we've called them, the bridge plans used to be around for just the use that, um, that Aaron and Sam described of, okay, so you're maybe graduating from college and you're starting a job, it will offer you health care, let's just get something uh, to cover you. Um, and then get the good um, insurance that, cover, that follows the rules as soon as you possibly can. The president has said through his administration, we're now going to have these available not for a bridge three months, but 364 days. Sound familiar? One day short of a year. And they can be renewed for up to three years. That is going to cause really, uh, really critical issues. And um, so we have a special procedure that you've been hearing my colleagues talk about that allows Congress to weigh in on a final rule that we think is unwise or harmful. And that's what we're going to be undertaking in the days and weeks to come. Um, we can do so in a way that should, will require a simple majority, not the special 60 vote rules uh, that we typically have in the Senate to move it forward through our House. and. Um, we're all going to need to work together and speak out about how important that is. It's not really a question, but more of a comment um, uh, to Chelsea. Um, so I've met Zoe, uh, and I don't really want to ask it as a question because it's almost too painful, but you said, you know, if this goes away, you're worried that she'll have to choose her profession carefully and she won't be able to... Um, take a job that doesn't have comprehensive health care. But she's four right now. 
and it's going to be a long time before she's choosing her profession. And we don't want to see you or your family face this uncertainty between age 4 and 18 or 22, or if she gets her doctor's degree when she becomes a doctor, uh, you know, 26, 27, 28, who knows? So um, thank you again for being here. Thank you so much. Um, and as Senator Baldwin mentioned, there is a process for reviewing rules, Congressional uh, Review Act, that does not require 60 votes, but a simple majority. And it's our intent uh, to use that and to work with all of you uh, to be able to stop this. Uh, so let me turn now to Senator Warren. Welcome. Ah, thank you very much. And thank you for your leadership, for calling us all here together. Uh, thank you, Senator Baldwin, for all that you're doing to help lead in this area, and all my colleagues who have spoken up on this. And thank you all for coming here to be witnesses today. You know, last year, when Republicans in Congress and President Trump tried to rip away health insurance from moms with breast cancer, from kids with complex medical need, from grandparents in nursing homes, People all across this country stood up and said, not on my watch. Millions of people spoke up, and that's how we saved health care for people all across this country. But the Republicans haven't stopped trying to roll back health care protection. Their latest attack is one that just lets insurance companies sell junk policies that don't have to comply with the requirements of the Affordable Care Act. So these junk plans don't have to cover essential health benefits like maternity care or addiction treatment. They can put dollar limits on coverage so insurance runs out right when someone needs it most. And they can discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions by charging them more or refusing to cover those services at all. So let me start there. Mr. Blokel, the Trump administration says that so-called short-term plans are an affordable option that might be right for some people. So I just want to ask you, were you looking for a skimpy health insurance plan when you went shopping for coverage? Not at all. <laughs> yeah. So what did you think you were buying? Well, I went into it trying to upgrade my health insurance. And you upgrade meaning more coverage. More coverage. So you go into the market thinking, I want better protection for myself, right, my family. Okay. And I was walked away with it with garbage, nothing. Yeah. I mean, so, so you went to a broker and you ended up with one of these so-called short-term plans, right? Correct. And here's what worries me. If the Trump administration gets its way, a whole lot more people are going to be in your situation. They're going to think they've purchased a policy that will be there when they need it most, only to find out at the moment of the bad diagnosis, at the moment that you get the call from the doctor's office or the hospital, you discover that the coverage wasn't there. So, so let me ask Another question around this one, Mr. Blokel. I understand that after battling the insurance company for coverage when you were diagnosed with lymphoma, that you now have substantial medical debt. Can you just say a word about what that medical debt has meant to you and your family? Um, how much yeah. medical debt are we talking about here? Hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Hundreds I mean, and hundreds. At one hundreds. point, it was 800, but um, a fair amount of that has been sold off to debt collectors at pennies but, on but the But it's dollar. still debt, right? Still Somebody debt. who calls you up. Yeah. So we're talking about now, I'm guessing, with interest running, something in excess of $800,000. The, the health care providers have sold off that debt to debt collectors. Can you just say a word about what that means on a on a day-to-day -day basis for your family? Well, being a small business owner, it's concerning, to say the least. I mean, um, it's hard to kind of try to grow your family and business and, and wake up every day and work hard um, to make money that you, know, you 
ultimately may lose in bankruptcy anyhow. I mean, I've already been advised to file bankruptcy, but kind of holding out and exploring all my options and making sure that's the only option. But um, yeah, it definitely keeps you up at night. Yeah. You know, I, I appreciate your sharing that. That's what health insurance is supposed to be for. It's supposed to be there when the bad diagnosis comes and you need coverage, when you need help, when you need help for yourself, when you need help for someone in your family. It's not health insurance if, when you need it most, it disappears. And that's what these junk plans are all about. So I believe strongly that we should overturn President Trump's junk plan rule and that we should require all short-term insurance companies to include basic protections like those in the ACA and including protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Senator Baldwin uh, has a proposal that will do exactly that, overturn the Trump rule. And I also have legislation that I've proposed to stop insurance companies from profiting off junk plans while they kick dirt in the family in the faces of the families who need them most. So I just want to say thank you all for staying in this fight on health care. This is this is a question of who we are as a people. We stand up for each other because we believe that health care is a basic human right. And as human beings we fight for basic human rights. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for telling your stories. Thank you so much. And uh, we're so glad to have Senator Chris Murphy with us today. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Stabenow. Thank you for convening this. Uh, thank you to our panelists for uh, interrupting your busy lives to uh, be here with us to tell you tell us your personal stories. Um, uh, Mr. Bogle, your story reminds me of one that I've told a, a few times um, a family that actually did uh, have to file for bankruptcy uh, before the Affordable Care Act was law. Um, you know, back before the Affordable Care Act was law, about one and a half uh, million people uh, every year filed for personal bankruptcy. I don't know if uh, Senator Baldwin just used these statistics. Um, and we knew at the time that about half of those, more than half of those, were because of these medical debts for people who were exactly in your position, Sam. And today that number uh, is uh, 750,000. That's a 50% decline in the number of people who file personal bankruptcies. Uh, and there's only one reason for it, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there's still some people that get into the situation that you're in, um, but there are hundreds of thousands less people uh, because they have access. Um, and that's astonishing. There's very few pieces of legislation that we pass that have that big an impact, a 50% reduction in the number of people who file bankruptcy in this uh, country, and we're putting it all at risk. The, the Burgers from Meriden, Connecticut, um, have a unique story. This is before the Affordable Care Act. Um, uh, they were on the husband's insurance uh, their entire life. Husband switched jobs. One week, one week he was without insurance. One single week. Guess what happened during that week? Son got diagnosed with cancer, uh, and it became a pre-existing condition that the new insurer would not cover. And you know what happened to the Burgers? They lost everything. They lost their house, they lost their savings, they lost the kids' college fund. They went bankrupt because of the misfortune of a diagnosis occurring in the one week, the seven-day period of time that they didn't have insurance. Um, that's a unique story, um, but there are uh, 750,000 unique stories um, that, um, that now have protection um, because of the Affordable Care Act. Um, Ms. Price, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, when you're 25, 26 years old, were you planning your life with the expectation that you were going to have to deal with a cancer diagnosis in your 20s? Uh, when I was 27, I was planning a lot of things. Cancer was not on my radar <laughs> at all. So you're not 26 anymore, but take us back into, um, into your head in your 20s, because what we're dealing with um, now are two assaults. Um, on one of the foundational ideas of the Affordable Care Act, that everybody should have insurance and that it actually benefits everybody um, when healthy people and non-healthy people have insurance because it balances out the costs. So the Congress ripped out the requirement that individuals have insurance from the Affordable Care Act. That's going to result in 13 million more people having 
um, having no insurance. Uh, and then these short-term plans give you the illusion of insurance when you really don't have it. And the worry is that a lot of people in their 20s who are feeling like they're healthy are going to either say, I don't need insurance, or are going to be attracted by these low premium policies that have no insurance because they feel invincible. You probably felt pretty invincible in your 20s. Um, what's the risk here from your perspective about um, sending a message to young people that they either don't need health insurance or um, they'd be fine with one of these uh, junk sham plans? Yeah, I mean, when you're in your 20s, 30s, you are healthy. You're not supposed to get cancer. You're not supposed to do anything. But anything, you could break your leg. That that requires a significant chunk of ER time. Um, you know, when you're in your 20s and 30s, you aren't supposed to get sick, but you do. You know, some people do. 80,000 young adults between ages 15 and 39 are diagnosed with cancer every single year in this country. That's just cancer. Right. Um, there are a number of other conditions that befall people in their 20s and 30s. And if you're in your 20s and 30s, you probably don't make a lot of money. You're starting your career. So it's even more devastating when you're hit with financial troubles and uh, medical bills because you don't have a savings account to pay for it. You don't have a, a sizable 401k you can dip into. You, you know, may or may not have family that can help with those. So you know, you're in a precarious financial position, you're trying to build your life, you're trying to buy a house, you're trying to plan for kids, you're trying to plan to get married, and all of a sudden you are hit with hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills that, if you're lucky, will be covered. If not, good luck. Yeah. yeah and, and listen, it's somebody pays. So in, in, in uh, Sam, in your case, either you're going to spend the rest of your life paying for something that was not your fault, or um, those hospitals that aren't getting paid those bills are going to find some other way to get recouped that money. They're going to jack up charges on somebody else in order to get that money back. So um, it's not as if um, somebody doesn't get hurt here, even if the bills don't get paid. Insurance is this miraculous way to spread the costs out over the largest number of people possible, rather than burdening one person or a small number of people. Um, I want to just ask one more question, and that's to you, Dr. Uh, Bowen. You had you had an interesting example in your testimony of somebody who um, had something really awful happen to them because they didn't have insurance. Um, but I imagine you run into a lot more people now, especially after the Affordable Care Act, who have some really important things happen to them because they have coverage, conditions that you uh, notice early on that you can get treatment for early on that don't end up turning catastrophic or can be managed later on. I, I, I'd love for you to just share maybe one example of, you know, it doesn't have to be somebody who's insured by the Affordable Care Act, but what does it mean in your line of work to be able to catch something early in their 20s? Um, what's the difference between um, having preventative coverage uh, versus having to wait until it becomes a crisis to deal with it in your line of work? It's huge. Um, as, as I tell my patients who are not pregnant, nobody goes into pregnancy to get a better body. So things happen. There are risks. We know that, for example, 5 to 7% of women, when they become pregnant, will develop diabetes. That's something that we can manage. So we can manage those patients. We can get them on medication if necessary. We can control what's happening so we don't end up with a huge baby or we don't end up with complications otherwise related to the diabetes. Um, we can identify medications that women should not be on. We can do so much troubleshooting. It makes all the difference in the world to know someone has developed high blood pressure, someone has a health problem, they have clotting issues, and we, and we need to put them on medication. Maybe they have risk for preterm delivery, and we can give them medication to prevent preterm labor. When things happen in obstetrics, it's fast. We don't have a lot of time. When a patient starts to bleed, we can lose a lot of blood in a short period of time. We need to anticipate that we have a patient who might bleed, who has complications, has placental issues, has clotting problems. So we could manage her care. We can give her the medications. We can get her the team that we need to have available so that when she comes in the door and she delivers, we're ready, we're prepared. We're going to give her and her baby and her family the best outcome they can get. Um, thank you for holding this uh, hearing. I'd love for the people who support these short-term plans to sit down and read a statement of benefits, right? I, I, I'd, I'd love for all the people who think that 
um, folks who are signing up for health insurance are, you know, just going to be smart consumers and be able to weigh the benefits of one versus the benefits of the other and actually sit down and see if they can understand um, the, the fine print of these junk plans that are in the business of trying to make you believe that you're getting coverage when you're not getting coverage, especially if you're in your 20s thinking to yourself, I'm never going to need this. Um, then all of a sudden you get pregnant, you have a complication, uh, and, you, uh, and you need it. I'm in the business of doing healthcare policy, and when I sign my family up for the exchange every year, it, it, it is most of what I'm reading is Greek to me, uh, never mind uh, to the folks that we are now asking to aggressively shop around given that the protections that we all put into the law to make sure that insurance is insurance are being eviscerated. So I went over, way over my time, but thank you, Senator Stabenow. Well, thank you, and you're exactly right, and that's why we're here, and that's why we're continuing to fight so hard uh, with all of you. And, you know, as we conclude, I just want to indicate again that, you know, we know that that for many people health insurance, health care costs are too high, but the way to address them is not to take away health care. Uh, frankly, it, we need to be addressing the real drivers of health care costs going up that we hear about all the time from doctors and hospitals and so on, and that's the cost of prescription drugs. If we really want to tackle what's going on, the, it's the fact that we have an unaccountable system around pricing for prescription drugs. So that's our next hearing, and we welcome people joining with us next week as we talk about the real costs uh, of prescription, or the real costs of health care, uh, and how we can actually bring that down together. We want to make sure that health care is affordable as well as available, and we know there are drivers of that, but as each of you have said, uh, there are consequences that actually raise costs by people not being able to get the care that they need, and certainly uh, health care is something that we can't choose to ignore and then know that we're never going to be sick. So that is the whole point. And I've just been told that Senator Ben Cardin from Maryland, who is a, another great advocate, is on his way. I don't know if we know how long, uh, if we know when he's coming, because we're certainly happy to hear his uh, uh, voice. And, uh, and while uh, we're waiting for Senator Cardin, because I do want to give him an opportunity to be able to uh, come and to ask questions and to speak. I'm going to ask uh, one more question of each of you that I think is an important question. If you were there, what would you say to the judge in the court case next month on pre-existing conditions, the case that is going to be decided next month? What would you want to say to the judge involved in deciding this case? Chelsea? I would want to tell him, like, that this is a matter of life and death for people. Health care, we, we can't take it away from people when they need it most. Otherwise, they're not going to have a life. Um, and there are millions of Americans out there that need this health care coverage, or they're going to go broke, or they're going to be denied this coverage, and that is not pro-life. It is, what do I want to say? Sure. It is almost signing like a death certificate for them because they're not going to be able to get that coverage and to be able to stay healthy. And then I'd have them look at my daughter in the eye and say, you don't get your health care coverage. Yeah, exactly. Aaron, what would you say to the judge in the court case next month about pre pre-existing conditions? You know, I think I would say that it's important to remember that poor health or a health event can happen to any single person. It will happen to every single person. Every single person in this country will have to go to the doctor at some point. Most will have something unexpected. It may be something very treatable. It may be something very short term. But we all have health. <laughs> we all befall poor health. Um, and we all deserve to have that coverage. And I would ask that judge to, if they feel that this isn't important, to look at a room full of people and handpick out which ones they would say don't deserve coverage. Choose, look them all in the eye and say, you deserve coverage, you don't. You deserve coverage, you don't. And that, I mean, that's essentially what we're doing. Um, 
And really, uh, just to echo the statement, remember that there are people behind these policies. It's not just a pocketbook. It's not just money. There are people whose lives are impacted dramatically by what we do and don't think about in 10 minutes. Thank you. Dr. Bohan. Thank you. Of course, I'm going to say maternity care. Maternity care is so crucial. Getting women in early, getting them involved, getting them understanding the do's and don'ts and the risks and the complications. We can save lives with maternity care. And I'd look at the judge and say, how can you not be in favor of something that we know will improve the health care of women and families and babies in this country? We have to have access to care. Thank you so much. Sam, what would you say to the judge? I would, I think these guys said most of it, but I, I think I would um, ask the judge to, to clarify what a pre-existing condition is, because in my case, um, obviously being very transparent, going to a chiropractor and then um, them denying based on a pre-existing condition, um, you know, that was based on United Healthcare's definition of what a pre-existing condition was. Um, so just overall clarity and, and the plans themselves. Thank you so much. Elena, what would you say to the judge on behalf of the little lobbyists? Well, I will do what I've been doing this past year and a half. I will bring my daughter. I will bring all of the little lobbyist families and their children who could come and tell her stories and ask the judge to look these children in the eye um, and know that with all that they've gone through, with all the surgeries, all the therapies, the way they fought for their lives, um, these brave, courageous little kids who just want a shot at life um, and tell them that, no, they can't go to school. They can't go out and play in the playgrounds and go to school, go to libraries and be with their big brothers and and big sisters, and that they don't deserve to live. I would ask that to have them have the judge look these kids in the eye and their families who have spent countless days and nights at hospital bedsides and say, No, your child is not worth it. And Senator Stavano, yes. can I just, add, can I just yes. quick, quick, quickly add what's so extraordinary about this case that's before the Supreme Court is that what the Trump administration is asking is for the judge to decide that the U.S. Constitution doesn't allow for people in your situations and your children's situations to be protected by the law, that our founding fathers wrote a document that leaves your kids and your lives to the wolves. Our founding document is not that cruel. <laughs> Right? Right. Um, it, right. It does not tie the hands of Congress when trying to solve for one of the biggest problems in America today, how people who are sick or people who have pre-existing conditions get access to coverage. Um, it is so extraordinary that our own president is going to the court system to try to get a finding that the Congress is prohibited by the Constitution to stand up and protect the families uh, here. Um, and. Um, I just think we have to continue to think about how to speak truth to power, both the judge who's deciding this case, but also the uh, president of the United States who is weighing in um, in an unprecedented fashion yes. uh, against the people of this country and against the ability of the government to try to protect you. Absolutely. And on that note, actually, we are now hearing that Senator Cardin is not going to be able to be here, but wanted very much to be here, uh, knowing that he had two wonderful constituents uh, from Maryland here, as well as uh, all of you. And so we will come to a conclusion today, but we are not done. This is a, a process. It's an ongoing process. It's worth fighting for, for all of our kids and our grandkids and our moms and dads and uh, everybody in this country. Healthcare is a basic human right. We want to tackle the cost. We want to tackle the real reason for costs going up because we have costs going up. And again, that's in part, large part, the unaccountable way in which prescription drugs are being priced today. And that's where we're focused because that's a very significant way to bring down the costs of health care for everyone. So thank you again, and we are adjourned. <laughs>